Hi everyone, welcome to Westside. I'm Eddie. And I believe that today God wants to move in our lives with the Holy Spirit. And for some of us, that could look like uh, a time during worship. For some of us, it could be words of encouragement uh, from each other. Uh, for some of us, it could be the message and the scripture. I'm honestly not quite sure how God's going to move in our lives, but I know he will. I also know that he will meet us wherever we're at. And for those of us, it could be watching us online. So I want us to take this moment uh, for us to become a bit more aware of God's presence in our lives. And I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give our humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all of them, all whom you've made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings in this life. But above all, your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the means of grace, for the hope of glory. And we pray that you give us such awareness of all your mercies and that with truly thankful hearts, we show forth praise, not only with our lips, but our lives by giving ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom uh, with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all the ages. Amen. Let the praise go up as the one. 
clouds come down on creation. Everything with breath repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you hear. praise and we ask now that as we open your scriptures as we learn more about who you are that that would still be true that we would be willing to praise you for really truly who you are for your character that even the things that would rub up against us and make us feel uncomfortable today we would be willing to open our hearts and our minds to have your spirit speak to us and impress upon us the things that you would have us learn and to accept and to live out and so now we pray that you would open the scriptures in a way where we don't just learn knowledge, but where we allow you to change us. And that we might continue to worship you, not just this morning here in songs, but also this afternoon when we go home to our families and tomorrow when we go into work or, or we, we work at home or we spend time doing whatever we've, we've done, we study, that our entire lives might be an expression of our love for you because you have loved us first. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Two things I want to do today. I want to look at a passage of scripture that I think has often been uh, misunderstood by a great number of people in churches. And so I want us to look carefully at it and inspect it and see uh, what God might have for us in that passage. And then I want to also give you some relational advice, some relationship advice that I think uh, will serve us well not just in romantic relationships, although specifically I think it could be transformational for those of us who are married, but also uh, if you're dating someone for your relationships at work, for your relationships with your friends, for each other, for people that you meet, I think uh, that we will find today uh, a principle that, that can really impact our lives in a great number of ways. Now, when we come to passages, really all passages of scripture, but certainly ones that are tricky and sometimes hard to understand, one of the things as we read scripture, we interpret scripture that's very important for us as an interpretive key is that Jesus 
is kept at the center and at the climax. So Jesus is at the center. When we interpret the scriptures, we always need to be revolving everything around Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, we read in Hebrews. That if you're wondering what God looks like, and you would say, well, a good place for us to start is the Bible. And you'd be right. And you would say, but specifically, how do we interpret the Bible? Because there's so much in here. And again, some of it gets very complicated and tricky. And sometimes we read it and we go, this... Man, I don't even know what to make of this. Um, well, we're looking for the Bible to help us steer towards Jesus. Sometimes we talk about the Bible as the Word of God. But in John chapter 1, we read that the Word of God, capital W, big picture, center, climax, if you really want to know what God is like, the Word of God became flesh in Jesus. He dwelt among us. That if you really want to know the heart of God, what God is like, and how He reveals Himself to us, we are uh, journeying through the Scriptures, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. And Jesus will reveal that. And that is our goal. As Christians, our goal is to follow Jesus. And so today, I want to start with something that Jesus said as we get back to our past passage in Ephesians, which we'll come to later, and I'll talk about what that's all about and why it's a little bit tricky. But I want to start with a passage that actually will, for many of us, uh, be difficult for us to, to really accept in our own lives because it's very countercultural and it's very counterintuitive. It's actually a, a very clear teaching of Jesus, one that he teaches over and over and over again, and yet it's one of the hardest things for his disciples, as we read in Scripture, for them to have really accepted and it's still one that's very difficult for us to accept today because it is so countercultural. It runs against the grain of what uh, most of us set out and aspire to in life, actually. So this comes from Matthew chapter 20, and it says, The mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, who are disciples of Jesus, came to him, Jesus, with her sons, and kneeling before him, he asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. That is the grain that most of us go with in life. It's authority. So Jesus, when you're in charge, I want my sons to be on your right hand and left hand. I want them to be your, your right hand and your left hand man. I want them to have some power. They're, they're following you. Tell me that you're going to give them authority. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Do you know where you're going if you're following me? What we're going to do? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. In other words, you can't seize power. God is in charge of that. And when they, the ten heard it, so the rest of the disciples, so now we get into a little power struggle. You guys are asking for power. You get your mom to ask you for power. I don't know how that works, if you really want. Anyway, they were indignant at the two brothers. Oh, you guys, you guys are trying to get ahead of us, huh? But Jesus called to him and said, to, called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom to many. Jesus, uh, would you make my sons the leaders, the authorities, the, the powerful people? And then the other ten come along and say, oh, you guys are trying to get ahead of us. We're not happy with that. We all want to be the leaders. And Jesus is trying to tell them, do you actually know what it looks like to drink the drink I'm going to drink? I am going to a cross. I am giving my life up as a ransom. I have come to serve. I have come to lay down my power. If you want to ask to be my right hand and my left hand, that's what you're signing up for, to become a servant. He uses the word even a slave. You would say slavery is a terrible thing. He's trying to get our attention using very strong language. You, if you're going to follow me, he's saying, you want to come to the pinnacle? Up is down. Servanthood. Up is down. Now, most of us, we aspire, if we're honest, to a life where more and more people serve us rather than we serve them. Isn't that true? I aspire to a life maybe where I get promoted and I have the say over other people. I don't have to do the menial, dirty jobs anymore. I get to tell somebody else to do that. Or I want to get to a place in life where I have enough money where people will do what I want them to do. I get to sit on vacation and there's all these other people who are here for me, to, to serve me, to give me what I want. I want to get my way in my relationships. 
I want to have authority. I want to have power. Think of your own examples. And so we are often like the mother of James and John or the other disciples saying, oh, if I follow Jesus right, maybe I'll get to the top and I'll be able to have authority and power and tell people what to do. Jesus says, well, that's probably not going to happen if you follow me. That's just not where I'm going. If you want to go up, you go down. We're going down. We're going to serve. If you want to follow me, you need to become a servant too, which brings us to a powerful, powerful principle for Christians. And if you're not a Christian, you're checking this out. Uh, again, this is one of the ones it's hard for all of us to accept because this is very countercultural. You may be just wading into a conversation about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And I'll just be clear about what that is, even though it is difficult for many of us to really accept in our lives. But Christians are to submit because Christ submitted. That's a big principle. We are called to submission. We are called, that means, to be servants, to serve other people, to put other people's interests above our own and to be here to serve us. That Jesus would teach us that those aspirations to get ahead so that other people will serve you is actually not the fullness of who you were created to be, but if you really want to find God, if you really want to find love, if you really want to find meaning and purpose and go deeper, then come follow me. We're giving up our lives to serve other people. Oh, it's a very difficult principle for us to live out. There's a great hymn in the New Testament in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Probably it was written in Philippians in a letter, but it was already something that would have been chanted or sung in the early church, and it's become um, pretty well known even today in, in Christian circles. You might have heard it. It's the Apostle Paul writing in Philippians 2, and he says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... If there's anything you've garnered for what God has done for you in Jesus and by his spirit, in other words, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having his mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, just get, you know, there, there is not a higher rung on this ladder. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped or held onto really tightly, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those words should be, for those of us in the room, we just sung some of those words. That is the name above all names. That he's praiseworthy, that we praise him. Well, what's so praiseworthy about Jesus is that he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped and held onto, and I can't go anywhere from here because I'm at the top and I'm in charge and I have the authority, but instead emptied himself and became a servant. That is what's praiseworthy. That's not often what's praiseworthy for us, is it? Who do we praise? Who do we give glory? Oh, it's the successful, it's the powerful, it's the people that are famous and we see them on TV and we we know that they've made tons of money and that they have tons of influence and it's very flashy. That's what's praiseworthy for most of us, isn't it? Hmm. But not so with God. You really want to know what's praiseworthy. You really want to know what's up? It's down. It's him who could have had all of that and emptied himself, becoming a servant for you and I, giving his life for you and I. That's what's praiseworthy. It flips everything upside down. And let's be honest, that's very difficult for us to accept. But Christians, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will be called to become a servant. You will be called to submit. And the reason is because Jesus came as a servant and submitted. He showed us what God is like. Here's where we find God. We find God in serving others. It's one of our expressions of love, the expressions of God's love that we can then give to other people. So here is uh, something I want you to keep in mind as we come to our next passage of scripture. Submission is a Christian thing, not a woman thing, not an age thing, not a slave thing. We'll come to that. That's, That's a big one. Submission is a Christian thing. 
you may not have decided to follow Jesus. That's okay. We welcome you here. We're, we're so glad because we want to share Jesus and what that's like. And we want you to, to, to think about that. You might be watching online and just checking this out and thinking it's absolutely crazy. Stick with me and I'll show you why I think this is so powerful. So for those of us who have committed to following Jesus, we need to understand and recognize it's all through scripture. It's all through the gospels. It's all through the New Testament. It's very clear Jesus calls us to be servants, to submit, to count others better than ourselves, to serve other people in love. Because, because Jesus is a servant. We're followers of Jesus. All of us who have chosen to be followers of Jesus, who have accepted his love, all of us, every single one of us, So now we come back to Ephesians chapter 5. We've been in this uh, book of the Bible for a number of weeks now. And uh, we come to our passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, which says, I'd love for you to, by the way, if you have a Bible, even an app on your phone or there at home, uh, join us there. Because I really, I would love for you to search through this and search through it on your own as we do this and maybe later. But verse uh, 22 of chapter 5 says, wives... Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself, its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should submit in everything to their husbands. This passage has often been read. We're going to continue. We're going to read about husbands. Uh, there's a passage there next about uh, parents and children, and then we'll talk about slaves and masters. And when we read this in our cultural setting, there's some alarm bells that go off, right? We obviously, in a a place in our world and our culture, where even stuff like this, we would read, wives submit to your husbands, and there'd be a lot of pushback. We would certainly get to passages on slavery and say, hold on, we cannot be endorsing slavery. So I want to tackle this and figure out what are the principles here that we're talking about. How should we read this? And again, I think it's often misunderstood. First thing you need to understand about this section. um, I don't know if you've got a Bible or your app. You'll notice that in the scriptures, there's often these little sub titles in the Bible. So you're reading along different verses and then maybe there's a little bolded section or something's in italics and it kind of is supposed to tell you what's coming next in, in the passage, a little summary or something like that. Those, just so you know, are not in the original biblical text. The translators have added those, and they're often helpful for us because they tell us, oh, here's, here's what's going on and, and what you can expect. But just so you know, again, those are added for our benefit. Now, some of your Bibles, our Bibles uh, translated, um, in verse, somewhere around verse 20 to 21 or 21 to 22, there will be a heading. They will be different in many of our translations. Some of them, there'll be a split. So it, it almost makes you think there's a split in content between, say, verse 20 and verse 21, or from verse 21 to 22. But really, in Greek, when this is originally written, there's not even very much, sometimes in the original, not any punctuation at all. It's just kind of like, a run-on thing. And so what we're trying to do is figure out where this goes from. Now, verse 22, when it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, we know, and some of you have a little heading just above that, and it says something like wives wives and husbands, or uh, rules for Christian households, or something like that. You just need to know, if you're reading this in Greek, you cannot read verse 22 without 21. It's impossible. You can't start there. There's no verb in verse 22 in the original Greek. It does not, the word submit does not show up in verse 22 in Greek. It is not there. It's implied. And this is actually not uncommon in the Greek language. Where we get the implication for that is the previous verse. And so if you have a heading there, it's not that it's a terrible, awful heading, but it might tell you, oh, start reading here and this is a new section. It's not. It's the same section. And again, it's impossible for us to read without reading verse 21, which remember, this is where we ended up last week if you're watching along or you were here last week, but it said in verse 21 that we are all... Everybody who's follower of Jesus, everybody in the church, everybody part of the community is supposed to submit in reverence to Christ. That's the heading for this whole thing. If you're living a spirit-filled life, if you're following Jesus, remember this is what it is, is to be a servant. What if you're a man? To be a servant. What if you're a woman? To be a servant. What if you're this? That, you know, all the categories. To be a servant. All of us are called to submit because Christ submitted. All of us are called to be servants because Christ is a servant. Do we got that? So submission, we need to understand, is not a woman thing. It's a Christian thing. Okay? Men, we got that? Can we get that? It's very important. Very, very important. So there's, uh, there's no uh, submit here in verse 22. It would, in Greek, say something like, um, wives, to your own husbands as to the Lord. So the force here is that what has just been said to all of us, 
submit to, your, to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now it would be like, you know, you might, to make this really clear, say, for example, wives to your husbands. And why should you submit? Wives? Because you're a woman? No, because you're a Christian. Now listen, in this culture, in this culture, very patriarchal, most women will look at this and say, that's great for you to write and tell me, but I don't have a choice. This was not 2021 in the Western world. Women didn't have much choice in to submit. They didn't have any power. They often didn't have a say. So wives, what we're saying here is, this is not necessarily a change in action for most of you, but it might be a change in attitude. Why should I submit? Because my culture has told me that I have to, and I have no choice. I have no voice. No, you submit because of reverence for Jesus. Because that's a godlike thing to do. Because it's good for your soul. Because it's where you find love and purpose and meaning. It's where you will find God, is to be someone who puts others' interests ahead of yourself. So your husbands, I know you haven't been given a choice thus far, but I'm giving you a choice. Submit to your husbands. Now we would come down, and I want to skip down, because you would say, some of us might say, okay, as you write this, and it's in the Bible, why didn't we go on a bit of a rant to say, oh, and by the way, we need to overthrow patriarchy and oppression of women, and on and on and on. Amen. skip down to uh, another topic that we, most of us, if we don't agree on the first part, I think most of us will agree on this part. We come down to where he talks about slaves. He says, bond servants or slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever God Whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or he is free. And you would say, why are you not saying that slavery is abhorrent? Because it is. And we might say, well, let's stop and think about what's happening here and what we're reading and what we're not reading. First, uh, Paul, in Galatians, he will talk about these different divisions, and he will say, these divisions that you have created to separate people are just that, created divisions that you need to do away with. Galatians 3, verse 28 says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there are places, and I think Jesus is very clear on this. I think the, the New Testament writers in certain places are very clear on this. These divisions that you guys have created to keep some people down and some people in power, you need to tear down. This whole, I'm a man, you're a woman, so I'm in charge thing, that needs to be done away with. This whole, I'm free and you're a slave thing is ridiculous. And you be, You're all one in Christ and you need to start acting like it. That is there. Now you'd say, well, in Ephesians, why is that not what he's doing? Remember what we're reading. We might want to say, uh, why are you not giving us a theological treatise on slavery and on patriarchy and on the place of women in, in society and, and all this kind of stuff? We're reading a letter, a letter that had an occasion written to certain people for a specific person, purpose. So sometimes we might want to say, this is the Bible and the Bible should give me everything I need to know about the topic that I'm looking into. But that's not always what we're reading. We're reading a letter that is addressing certain concerns at a certain time for certain specific people. Not always, although this happens in the Bible, but not always saying, I want to tell you everything about this entire topic. And so uh, we as a church might one day send out, for an example, an email to say, hey, you know, we're really trying to get away from um, one-use plastics, and so we're going to encourage everybody uh, to bring your own coffee mug for church to refill it so that we're not throwing all... Because we have a climate crisis. Now imagine if 2,000 years later, after... Uh, I hope, humanity figures out the climate crisis and figures out how to actually live in a sustainable way in the world one day. If they look back 2,000 years later and pulled out that email, they would go, why is this church not giving me a theological underpinning for creation care and how we're supposed, and they thought that just, you know, taking away one-use plastics was going to change the world, but we know that you need to do, that. and we would go, if we could, 2,000 years separated, go, we would have loved to do that, but this was just an email talking about our coffee cups. 
we had one specific thing we were trying to do. And yes, all of this is really good, but it just wasn't the purpose of this. And we need to look at Paul and go, Paul in this letter is not dismantling the entire system, although we might like him to do that. And I think he does it in other places. Here, he's talking about what it means to be submissive. And again, he comes to servant slaves. By the way, most of us think of slavery in terms of our recent history, certainly in the Western world, relatively recent history. And it's mostly uh, a lot of that is, is built up and involved rolled around race. For the original hearers of this letter, people who would have read this or, or listened to it in church, it would have been more around debt. And that doesn't mean it's not abhorrent and terrible, but it would have been more, uh, you get, you, you find yourself or someone in your, your family in slavery because you owe somebody something. They come and call in the debt. You can't pay it. And they say, well, I'm taking your son then to work it off. And then, of course, we're not going to pay him enough for the work that he does to free him. And so he ends up in perpetual slavery in a bad situation. Um, that's a little bit of the context. But here, uh, again, it's saying, listen, you're a servant to somebody. You're a slave to somebody. You haven't been given a choice. But look what he says. He says, and don't do this for people pleasing. Don't do this because of your, your, your earthly masters here. Don't do this because you have to do it because your culture has forced you into slavery. Because that's a terrible, terrible, horrible thing. Nobody should ever be enslaved but you can choose to be a servant of God and to serve others, to put them first. It's just such a radical thing for us to think of. Now, when we go back to the the part about wives, grammatically in that section from verses 22 to 24, there's no actual command grammatically to the women, to the wives. There's no specific, I'm commanding you to do this. And it's a fairly brief little passage. Again, most women who are married would have gone, oh, great, submit to my husband like I have a choice. Okay, but I'm doing this because... Because serving is a Christian thing to do, not because I have to do it, not because it's right that somebody has told me to do it, but because it's a Christian thing to do. I get it. This is going to change me. So first, understand this. As we look at those two two examples given to wives and given to slaves, submission is not enduring abuse, okay? This passage has often just been read and said, wives, submit to your husband. That means no matter what's happening in your household, wives, do whatever your husband says. That's awful and terrible. It's not what this passage is about. It's not about enduring abuse. Just like it's not about endorsing slavery. Oh, so slavery's okay and slaves are just supposed to submit. Because remember, who's supposed to submit? Everybody's supposed to submit. Everybody. Not just the people who are not in power. In fact, the things that they're told look very different from the people who did have power or do have power. So now we come to husbands who are given uh, specific commands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now we read in the passage previously that the husband is the head of the wife. We sometimes, in our our cultural um, way of reading head, we assume that means leader. He's the head of a company. She's the head of whatever, this organization. Head can mean a whole bunch of things. It means your head. Literally, your physical head. Um, Sometimes it means leader, but uh, less often in this culture than our culture, head would mean that. Head can also mean the source of life, as in your husband gives you life. Uh, It could refer to the fact that, again, in that culture, very much the the husbands were always the provider, and women didn't have necessarily nearly as many opportunities uh, to provide for themselves economically as men did. But interestingly enough, this word head is used in a military uh, setting. And it's not for the general who commands everybody to do what he says to do. It's used as the first soldier who goes into battle and sacrifices his life for everybody else. The first one who goes into danger ahead of everybody else. It is the scariest, most sacrificial position. I am going in, and likely it means in a battle, that the first ones will be the first ones to die. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Notice also... We might say that Jesus is the head of the church, that he's the leader of the church, but that's not the example that's given here. That's not the characteristic that is pointed to here. Uh, Husbands, you're the leader of the church like Jesus is. No, husbands, you're to love the church, you're to love your wives the way that Christ loved the church, which is what? Gave himself up for her. First one into battle, giving up his rights, giving up his wants, giving up his needs, giving up his safety. And then some beautiful language. Pick up on the metaphors here. That's amazing. That he might 
sanctifier, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So husbands, how are you to love your wife? Do you see the metaphors in there and the way that so skillfully um, the husband is given in this, again, in this very patriarchal culture, a very feminine role? Give your wife a bath. Something that a, a, a woman, the wife, would typically do for her children. Wash her in the water and the word. Be so, be so caught up in her needs, spiritual needs, that you would be washing her. That you would be like the mom of the family. By the way, language that we find in Ezekiel of what God does for the church. Very in this cultural. Just think about this. This is very just feminine language. Not because having a bath is innately feminine, giving a bath. But it was in that culture, right? That's how they, they did things. And what's the next little metaphor? Doing the laundry. So she'll have no wrinkle or stain. You, you give your family, give your wife a bath. Be like what you see your mother doing your wife doing. Do the laundry, something that maybe you would say, uh, and I'm not saying we should use this language, but they might have said that's woman's work. Yes, yes, exactly, men. Because you're a servant. And why are you supposed to be a servant? You guys can say it. Because Jesus is a servant. Why do you submit? Because Jesus submitted. That's what followers of Jesus do. Because I'm a woman? No, because you're a follower of Jesus. Because I'm a man? No, because you're a follower of Jesus. Because I'm a slave? No, because you're a follower of Jesus. We're all called to submit. You want to go up? You go down. Everything turned on its head. And then we would say, but does this mean that we should endure abuse if we're in an abusive situation or endorse slavery? No, absolutely not. And there's tons of scripture that talks all about that. There's no male or female. There's no Jew or Greek. There, there's no free or slave. All these categories, doesn't mean we're all the same, but it means all these categories you're using for some people to have power and other people to be oppressed. We need to break down. And do you know how we do that? We don't just say, therefore, I should be on top. I should take power. We all say we should serve one another. Because if we're all just trying to climb over each other to be on top, it's just an ongoing power struggle. And that is what Paul will next talk about in marriage. He says, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the church does, the church, uh, Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. Then he quotes from Genesis and he talks about two people being married and what is the ultimate picture of marriage. That two people become one. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So we're not in a power struggle. We're in it together. It's not me versus you. That never works in marriage. It doesn't work in any relationships. But in marriage, we're one flesh. What happens good for you happens good for me. What happens bad to you happens bad to me. And so the power structure of I have to lord my power over you, I tell you what to do and you follow, just doesn't work anymore. We now become one. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Listen, this, what's, what's, quoted here from Genesis chapter 2 about marriage, two people becoming one, is before what theologically we call the fall. So there's a story, there's a man, there's a woman, Adam and Eve, they're walking around in the garden. It says they're naked and unashamed, which is not just physical, it's metaphoric, it's deeper to say they were vulnerable with each other in every way. They could be completely vulnerable and open with each other and they were not ashamed with each other. What a beautiful picture of relationship, a beautiful picture of marriage. I can be my complete self with you and tell you all that I am and you to me. And it's so good. We're one flesh together. And then they sin. And that is broken. And all of a sudden they feel like they need to hide themselves because they're ashamed. And God, you know, comes and says, well, who told you that you were naked? And oh, something's happened. And now we are ashamed. There's something that's wrong between us. And then there's this list of curses that this is what life is going to look like now that sin is introduced, now that that relationship has been broken. And talking about a husband and wife relationship, the marriage relationship in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, second part of it says, speaking to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And that first part of that phrase, your desire will be for your husband, is a Hebrew idiom, which means you will want to be in charge. 
and your husband will be in charge of you. In other words, your relationship now is going to have a power struggle that was not supposed to be there. And you're going to think that it's all about what you want and you should be in charge and you should get what you want in your way and on and on and on. And that's not a blessing, that's a curse. And in Ephesians, we're talking about reversing the curse. And how do you reverse the curse? You can't do it by saying, I need to be in charge and I need to get my way. You do it by becoming a servant, by considering others better than yourself. Who is supposed to do that? Everyone is supposed to do that. Unfortunately, and I don't really understand, I do understand it, but when we read this, a lot of people have come to the conclusion that this means that husbands get to tell their wives what to do and women don't have a say. And what this passage says is the opposite of that. You're all servants. You serve each other. Well, then who gets the final word? You serve each other and you figure it out. It's wisdom. You put each other first. And as you serve each other, you make good decisions about what you're supposed to do together in a marriage or, or in a friendship or in other relationships. This last um, part of this verse in verse 33, it says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And then a lot of translations say, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Again, has been weaponized to say, and wives, if you're married, you need to respect your husband no matter what. The and there is actually a conditional clause that would be better translate so that. This is again, Still a passage that is being uh, taught to the husbands. Let each of one of you love his wife as himself so that the wife sees that she respects her husbands. Husbands, treat your wives in such a way that of course they're going to respect you because you're willing to give yourself up for them. Serve them, care for them the way that Jesus has done for all of us. Submission is not enduring abuse or endorsing oppression. Far from it, the opposite of it. But submission is to take the posture of a servant, willingly, all of us who would follow Jesus. So what is my advice to you relationally? Well, uh, perhaps you'll ask the question, if you're married to your spouse, maybe your boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe to your boss, somebody that you interact with this week and say, how can I serve you? And maybe not literally, because that language might be a little weird in certain contexts, but can I do for you? How can I make your life better? How can I put your interests above mine? How can I make your life a little bit easier? How, how can I help you focus on your spiritual needs in our household? Because I love you so much. And so if that means I need to take the kids, I need to wash the dishes, I need to lay down what I want to do for this time so that you have time to do it. Or, or, or we're going to go get a babysitter so that we can sit down together and focus on our spiritual needs. Or so that I can just give you a break. Or so that I can make you know, things at the company a little bit better. Not because I have to. Not because you can oppress me, not because I'm told that, that there's, this is the cultural expectation and there's no other way to do it, but I submit because Christ submits. Because I'm trying to believe, even when it's difficult and goes against the grain of everything that I feel like I want, it is praiseworthy that Jesus teaches us down is up. So Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, We praise you that you serve us, willing to sacrifice yourself, even to death on a cross. Oh, it's so glorious. It's just just the opposite of what we've often been taught that glory is. So today we just take these moments to, uh, I pray God, we just, would you let that sink into our hearts, the glory of servanthood? The glory of Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be tightly held on to and grasped, but instead he emptied himself for us. Oh God, thank you. We say thank you for that. And may that beautiful picture of love and submission be one that changes the disposition of our hearts towards one another. And would you help us to be great in your kingdom as we serve one another. Amen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today was an amazing message about how we can submit and be servants just as, just as Christ was. Um, one of the huge aspects of that is we, we aspire to be at a church that both church people and unchurched people can attend. Uh, and we have a really great opportunity to do that uh, this upcoming Halloween with our trunk and treating um, experience. Uh, This is a chance for families to come by with children, uh, to get candy, to build relationships. Um, So 
In order to do that, we need a couple of different things. One, we need candy. Uh, so if you want to donate, please, there are bins outside, please do so. Two, we need volunteers. We need people who are gonna help decorate. And if that's you, and if you're interested, please email us at info at westsidehamilton.com. And three, one of the big reasons why we're doing this event is also to raise funds. It's going to be for Food for Kids Hamilton. So please, if you're interested as well, please feel free to donate. Also, Life Groups is starting this Monday and Wednesday at 7. Uh, we're starting the Alpha Groups. Uh, it's going to be a great chance for us to have discussion, build relationships, and, and grow our faith. So please, this Monday and Wednesday at 7 o'clock here, um, please feel free to join in. If you haven't signed up, please feel free to do so. Lastly, there are a ton of really, really great events uh, happening here. Uh, this October, we have the Trunk or Treating. In November, we have uh, Food Share Hamilton. And just five weeks from now, we are starting our Christmas season. Can you believe that? December is five weeks away. Um, so uh, in order for all those things to be possible, um, please feel free to give. Uh, we thank you so much for giving so sacrificially, so generously. Um, you can do so uh, by giving online. Uh, you can do so by giving uh, at the giving station. Uh, they take debit, credit, and visa. Um, we thank you so much. None of the work that we do is possible without you. So thank you so much. Also, uh, this concludes the end of service. So uh, again, I want to thank you. And I ask that the back rows leave first. Uh, feel free to connect outside. Uh, it is a little chilly, but we do appreciate the conversation in the community. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye now.